Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 7, Fantasy and Utopia. In Freud's theory, the mental forces opposed to the reality principle appear chiefly as relegated to and operating from the unconscious. The rule of the unmodified pleasure principle obtains only over the deepest and most archaic unconscious processes. They can provide no standards for the construction of the non-repressive mentality, nor for the truth value of such a construction. But Freud singles out fantasy as one mental activity that retains a high degree of freedom from the reality principle, even in the sphere of the developed consciousness. We recall his description in the two principles of mental functioning. With the introduction of the reality principle, one mode of thought activity was split off. It was kept free from reality testing and remained subordinated to the pleasure principle alone. This is the act of fantasy making, which begins already with the game of children, and later continued as daydreaming abandoned its dependence on real objects. Fantasy plays the most decisive function in the total mental structure. It links the deepest layers of the unconscious with the highest products of consciousness, art, the dream with, with the reality. It preserves the archetypes of the genus, the perpetual but repressed ideas of the collective and individual memory, the tabooed images of freedom. Freud establishes a twofold connection between the sexual instincts and fantasy on the one side and between the ego instincts and the activities of consciousness on the other. This dichotomy is untenable, not only in view of the later formulation of the instinct theory, which abandons the independent ego instincts, but also because of the incorporation of fantasy in, into artistic and even normal consciousness. However, the affinity between fantasy and sexuality remains decisive for the function of the former. The recognition of the recognition of fantasy, imagination, as a thought process with its own laws and truth values was not new in psychology and philosophy. Freud's original contribution lay in the attempt to show the genesis of this mode of thought and its essential connection with the pleasure principle. The establishment of the reality principle causes a, div a division and mutilation of the mind, which fatefully determines its entire development. The mental process formerly unified in the pleasure ego is now split. Its mainstream is channeled into the domain of the reality principle and brought into line with its requirements. Thus conditioned, this part of the mind obtains the monopoly of interpreting, manipulating, and altering reality, of governing remembrance and oblivion, even of, defi of defining what reality is and how it should be used and altered. The other part of the mental apparatus remains free from the control of the reality principle at the price of becoming powerless, inconsequential, unrealistic. Whereas the ego was formerly guided and driven by the whole of its mental energy, it is now to be guided only by that part of it which conforms to the reality principle. This part and this part alone is to set the objectives, norms, and values of the ego. As reason, it becomes the sole repository of judgment, truth, rationality. It decides what is useful and useless, good and evil. Fantasy as a separate mental process is born at the same time left behind by the organization of the pleasure ego into the reality ego. Reason prevails. It becomes unpleasant but useful and correct. Fantasy remains pleasant but becomes useless, untrue, a mere play, daydreaming. As such, it continues to speak the language of the pleasure principle, of freedom from repression, of uninhibited desire and gratification. But reality proceeds according to the laws of reason, no longer committed to the dream language. However, fantasy, imagination, retains the structure and the tendencies of the psyche prior to its organization by the reality prior to its becoming an individual set off against other individuals. And by the same token, like the id to which it remains committed, imagination preserves the memory of the subhistorical past when the life of the individual was the life of the genus, 
the image of the immediate unity between the universal and the particular under the rule of the pleasure principle. In contrast, the entire subsequent history of man is characterized by the destruction of this original unity, the position of the ego in its capacity of independent individual organism comes into conflict with itself and its other capacity as a member of a series of generations. The genus now lives in the conscious and ever renewed conflict among the individuals in between them and their world. Progress under the performance principle proceeds through these conflicts. The Principium Individuationis, as implemented by this reality principle, gives rise to the repressive utilization of the primary instincts, which continue to strive, each in its own way, to cancel the Principium Individuationis, while they are constantly diverted from their objective by the very progress which their energy sustains. In this effort, both instincts are subdued. In and against the world of the antagonistic Principium Individuationis, imagination sustains the claim of the whole individual, in union with the genus and with the archaic past. Freud's metapsychology here restores imagination to its rights. As a fundamental, independent mental process, fantasy has a truth value of its own, which corresponds to an experience of its own, namely the surmounting of the antagonistic human reality. Imagination envisions the reconciliation of the individual with the whole, of desire with realization, of happiness with reason. While this harmony has been removed into utopia by the established reality principle, fantasy insists that it must and can become real, that behind the illusion lies knowledge. The truths of imagination are first realized when fantasy itself takes form, when it creates a universe of perception and, and comprehension a subjective and at the same time objective universe. This occurs in art. The analysis of the cognitive function of fantasy is thus led to aesthetics as the signs of beauty. Behind the aesthetic form lies the repressed harmony of sensuousness and reason. The eternal protest against the organization of life by the logic of domination, the critique of the performance principle. Art is perhaps the most visible return of the repressed not only on the individual, but also on the generic historical level. The artistic imagination shapes the unconscious memory of the liberation that failed, of the promise that was betrayed. Under the rule of the performance principle, art opposes to institutionalized repression the image of man as a free subject, but in a state of unfreedom, art can sustain the image of freedom only in the negation of unfreedom. Since the awakening of the consciousness of freedom, there is no genuine work of art that does not reveal the archetypal content, the negation of unfreedom. We shall see later how this content came to assume the aesthetic form governed by aesthetic principles. As aesthetic phenomenon, the critical function of art is self-defeating. The very commitment of art to form vitiates the negation of unfreedom in art. In order to be negated, unfreedom must be represented, represented in the work of art with the semblance of reality. This element of semblance, show, shine, necessarily subjects the represented reality to aesthetic standards and thus deprives it of its terror. Moreover, the form of the work of art invests the content with the qualities of enjoyment, style, rhythm, meter, introduce an aesthetic order, which is itself pleasurable. It reconciles with the content. The aesthetic quality of enjoyment, even entertainment, has been inseparable from the essence of art, no matter how tragic, how uncompromising the work of art is. Aristotle's proposition on the cathartic effect of art epitomizes the dual function of art, both to oppose and to reconcile, both to indict and to acquit both to recall the repressed and to repress it again, purified. People can elevate themselves with the classics. They read and see and hear their own archetypes rebel, triumph, give up, or perish. And since all this is aesthetically formed, they can enjoy it and forget it. Still, within the limits of the aesthetic form, art expressed, although in an, in, in ambivalent manner, the return of the repressed image of liberation, art was opposition. 
At the present stage in the period of total mobilization, even this highly ambivalent opposition seems no longer viable. Art survives only where it cancels itself, where it saves its substance by denying its traditional form and thereby denying reconciliation, where it becomes surrealistic and atonal. Otherwise, art shares the fate of all genuine human communication. It dies off. What Karl Kraus wrote at the beginning of the fascist period is still true. Das Wort entschlief als gen welt erwacht. <laughs> in a less sublimated form, the opposition of fantasy to the reality principle is more at home in such subreal and surreal processes as dreaming, daydreaming, play, the stream of consciousness. In its most extreme claim for gratification beyond the reality principle, fantasy cancels the established principium individuationis itself. Here perhaps are the roots of fantasy's commitment to the primary eros. Sexuality is the only function of a living organism which extends beyond the individual and secures its connection with its species. Insofar as sexuality is organized and controlled by the reality principle, Fantasy asserts itself chiefly against normal sexuality. We have previously discussed the affinity between fantasy and the perversions. However, the erotic element in fantasy goes beyond the perverted expressions. It aims at an erotic reality where the life instincts would come to rest in fulfillment without repression. This is the ultimate c content of the fantasy process in its opposition to the reality principle. By virtue of this content, fantasy plays a unique role in the mental dynamic. Freud recognized this role, but at this point, his metapsychology reaches a fateful turn. The image of a different form of reality has appeared as the truth of one of the basic mental processes. This image contains the lost unity between the universal and the particular, and the integral gratification of the life instincts by the reconciliation between the pleasure and reality principles. Its truth value is enhanced by the fact that the image belongs to mankind over and above the principium individuationis. However, according to Freud, the image conjures only the sub-historical past of the genus and of the individual prior, prior to all civilization. Because the latter can develop only through the destruction of the sub-historical unity between pleasure principle and reality principle, the image must remain buried in the unconscious, and imagination must become mere fantasy, child's play, daydreaming. The long road of consciousness which led from the primal horde to ever higher forms of civilization cannot be reversed. Freud's conclusions preclude the notion of an ideal state of nature, but they also hypostasize a specific historical form of civilization as the nature of civilization. His own theory does not justify this conclusion. From the historical necessity of the performance principle and from its perpetuation beyond historical necessity, it does not follow that another form of civilization under another reality principle is, is impossible. In Freud's theory, freedom from repression is a matter of the unconscious, of the sub-historical and even subhuman past of primal biological and mental processes. Consequently, the idea of a non-repressive reality principle is a matter of retrogression. That such a principle could itself become a historical reality, a matter of developing consciousness, that the images of fantasy could refer to the unconquered future of mankind rather than to its badly conquered past, all this seemed to Freud at best a nice utopia. The danger of abusing the discovery of the truth value of imagination for retrogressive tendencies is exemplified by the work of Carl Jung. More emphatically than Freud, he has insisted on the cognitive force of imagination. According to Jung, fantasy is undistinguishably united with all other mental functions. It appears not as primeval, now as the ultimate and most audacious synthesis of all capabilities. Fantasy is, above all, the creative activity out of which flow the answers to all answerable questions. It is the mother of all possibilities, in which all mental opposites as well as the conflict between internal and external world are united. Fantasy has always built the bridge between irreconcilable demands of object and subject, extroversion and introversion. 
The simultaneously rep retrospective and expectant character of imagination is thus clearly stated. It looks not only back to an aboriginal golden past, but also forward to all still unrealized but realizable possibilities. But already in Young's earlier work, the emphasis is on the res retrospective and consequently fantastic qualities of imagination. Dream thinking moves in a retrograde manner toward the raw material of memory. It is a, reg a regression to the original perception. In the development of Young's psychology, it's, it's obscure obscurantistic and reactionary trends have become predominant and have eliminated the critical insights of Freud's metapsychology. The truth value of imagination relates not only to the past but also to the future. The forms of freedom and happiness which it invokes claim to deliver the historical reality. In its refusal to accept as final the limitations imposed upon freedom and happiness by the reality principle, in its refusal to forget what can be, lies the critical function of fantasy. Um, réduire l'imagination à l'esclavage, combien même il y irait de ce qu'on appelle grossièrement le bonheur. C'est se dérober à tout ce qu'on trouve, au fond de soi, de justice suprême. suprême. La seule imagination me rende compte de ce qui peut être. The surrealists recognize the revolutionary implications of Freud's discoveries. Imagination is perhaps about to reclaim its rights. But when they asked, cannot the dream also be applied to the solution of the fundamental problems of life? They went beyond psychoanalysis in demanding that the dream be made into reality without compromising its content. Art allied itself with the revolution, uncompromising adherence to the strict truth value of imagination comprehends reality more fully. That the propositions of the artistic imagination are untrue in terms of the actual organization of the facts belongs to the essence of their truth. The truth that some proposition respecting an actual occasion is untrue may express the vital truth as to the aesthetic achievement. It expresses the great refusal, which is its primary characteristic. This great refusal is the protest against unnecessary repression, the struggle for the ultimate form of freedom, to live without anxiety. But this idea could be formulated without punishment, only in the language of art. In the more realistic context of political theory and even philosophy, it was almost universally defamed as utopia. The relegation of real possibilities to the no man's land of utopia is itself an essential element of the ideology of the performance principle. If the construction of a non-repressive instinctual development is oriented, not on the sub-historical past, but on the historical present and mature civilization, the very notion of utopia loses its meaning. The negation of the performance principle emerges not against, but with the progress of conscious rationality. It presupposes the highest maturity of civilization. The very achievement of the performance principle have intensified the discrepancy between the archaic unconscious and conscious processes of man, on the one hand, and his actual potentialities on the other. The history of mankind seems to tend toward another turning point in the vicissitudes of the instincts. And, just as the, pre the preceding turning points, the adaptation of the, the archaic mental structure to the new environment would mean another catastrophe, an explosive change in the environment itself. However, while the first turning point was, according to the Freudian hypothesis, an event in geological history, and while the second occurred at the beginning of civilization, the third turning point would be located at the highest attained level of civilization. The actor in this event would be no longer the historical animal man, but the conscious, rational subject that has mastered and appropriated the objective world as the arena of his realization. The historical factor contained in Freud's theory of instincts has come to fruition in history when the basis of Anank which, for Freud, provided the rationale for the repressive reality principle, is undermined by the progress of civilization. Still, there is some validity in the argument that, despite all progress, scarcity and immaturity remain great enough to prevent the realization of the principle to each according to his needs. 
The material as well as mental resources of civilization are still so limited that there must be a vastly lower standard of living if social productivity were redirected toward the universal gratification of individual needs. Many would have to give up manipulated comforts if all were to live a human life. Moreover, the prevailing international structure of industrial civilization seems to condemn such an idea to ridicule. This does not invalidate the theoretical insistence that the performance principle has become obsolescent. The reconciliation between pleasure and reality principle does not depend on the existence of abundance for all. The only pertinent question is whether a state of civilization can be reasonably envisaged in which human needs are fulfilled in such a manner and to such an extent that surplus repression can be eliminated. Such a hypothetical state could be reasonably assumed at two points, which lie at the opposite poles of the vicissitudes of the instincts. One would be located at the primitive beginnings of history, the other at its most mature stage. The first would refer to a non-oppressive distribution of scarcity, as may, for example, have existed in matriarchal phases of ancient society. The second would pertain to a rational organi organization of fully developed industrial society after the conquest of scarcity. The vicissitudes of the instincts would of course be very different under these two conditions, but one decisive feature must be common to both. The instinctual development would be non-repressive in the sense that at least the surplus repression necessitated by the interests of domination would not be imposed upon the instincts. This quality would reflect the prevalent satisfaction of the basic human needs, most primitive at the first, vastly extended and refined at the second stage. Sexual as well as social, food, housing, clothing, leisure. This satisfaction would be, and this is the important point, without toil, that is, without the rule of alienated labor over the human existence. Under primitive conditions, alienation has not yet arisen, because of the primitive character of the needs themselves, the rudimentary, personal or sexual character of the division of labor and the absence of an institutionalized hierarchical specialization of functions. Under the ideal conditions of mature industrial civilization, alienation would be completed by general, auto or general automization of labor, reduction of labor time to a minimum and exchangeability of functions. Since the length of the working day is itself one of the principal repressive factors imposed upon the pleasure principle by the reality principle, the reduction of the working day to a point where the mere quantum of labor, time, no longer arrests human development is the first prerequisite for freedom. Such reduction by itself would almost certainly mean a considerable decrease in the standard of living, prevalent today in the most advanced industrial countries. But the regression to a lower standard of living would which the collapse of the performance principle would bring about does not militate against progress and freedom. The argument that makes liberation conditional upon an ever higher standard of living all too easily serves to justify the perpetuation of repression. The definition of the standard of living in terms of automobiles, television sets, airplanes and tractors is that of the performance principle itself. Beyond the rule of this principle, the level of living would be measured by other criteria the universal gratification of the basic human needs and the freedom from guilt and fear, internalized as well as external, instinctual as well as rational. La vraie civilisation n'est pas dans le gaz ni dans la vapeur ni dans les tables tournantes. Elle est dans la diminution des traces du péché original. This is the definition of progress beyond the rule of the performance principle. Under optimum conditions, the prevalence in mature civilization of material and intellectual wealth would be such as to allow painless gratification of needs, while domination would no longer systematically forestall such gratification. In this case, the quantum of instinctual energy still to be diverted into necessary labor, in turn completely mechanized and rationalized, would be so small that a large area of repressive constraints and modifications, no longer sustained by external forces, would collapse. Consequently, the antagonistic relation between pleasure principle and reality principle would be altered in favor of the former. Eros, the life instincts, would be released to an unprecedented degree. 
Does it follow that civilization would explode and revert to prehistoric savagery? That the individuals would die as a result of the exhaustion of the available means of gratification and of their own energy? That the absence of want and repression would drain all energy which could promote material and intellectual production on a higher level and larger scale? Freud answers in the affirmative. His, his answer is based on his more or less silent acceptance of a number of assumptions. That free libidinal relations are essentially antagonistic to work relations. That energy has to be withdrawn from the former in order to institute the latter. That only the absence of full gratification sustains the societal organization of work. Even under optimum conditions of a rational organization of society, the gratification of human needs would require labor, and this fact alone would enforce quantitative and qualitative instinctual restraint, and thereby numerous social taboos. No matter how rich, civilization depends on steady and meth methodical work, and thus on unpleasurable delay in satisfaction. Since the primary instincts rebel by nature against such delay, the repressive modification therefore remains a necessity for all civilization. In order to meet this argument, we would have to show that Freud's correlation, instinctual repression, socially useful labor, civilization, can be meaningfully transformed into the correlation, instinctual, liberal, liber, blah, 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 instinctual liberation, socially useful work, civilization. We have suggested that the prevalent instinctual repression resulted not so much from the necessity of labor, but from the specific social organization of labor imposed by the interest in domination, that repression was largely surplus repression. Consequently, the elimination of surplus repression would per se tend to eliminate not labor, but the organization of the human existence into an instrument of labor. If this is true, the emergence of a non-repressive reality principle would alter rather than destroy the social, social organization of labor. The liberation of Eros could create new and durable work relations. Discussion of this hypothesis encounters at the outset one of the most strictly protected values of modern culture, that of productivity. This idea expresses perhaps more than any other the existential attitude in industrial civilization. It permeates the philosophical definition of the subject in terms of the ever-transcending ego. Man is evaluated according to his ability to make, augment, and improve socially useful things. Productivity thus designates the degree of the mastery and transformation of nature, the progressive replacement of an uncontrolled natural environment by a controlled technological environment. However, the more the division of labor was geared to utility for the established productive apparatus rather than for the individuals, in other words, the more the social need de deviated from the individual need, the more productivity tended to contradict the pleasure principle and to become an end in itself. The very word came to smack of repression or its Philistine glorification. It connotes the resentful defamation of rest, indulgence, receptivity, the triumph over the lower depths of the mind and body, the taming of the instincts by exploitative reason. Efficiency and repression converge, raising the productivity of labor is the sacrosanct ideal of both capitalist and Stalinist Stalinovism. This notion of productivity has its historical limits. They are those of the performance principle. Beyond its domain, productivity has another content and another relation to the pleasure principle. They are anticipated in the process of imagination, which preserve freedom from the performance principle while maintaining the claim of a new reality principle. The utopian claims of imagination have become saturated with historical reality. If the achievements of the performance principle surpass its institutions, they also militate against the direction of its productivity, against the subjugation of man to his labor. Freed from this enslavement, productivity loses its repressive power and impels the free development of individual needs. Such a change in the direction of progress goes beyond the fundamental reorganization of social labor, which it presupposes. No matter how justly and rationally the material production may be organized, it can never be a realm of freedom and gratification. 
but it can release time and energy for the free play of human faculties outside the realm of alienated labor. The more complete the alienation of labor, the greater the potential of freedom. Total automation would be the optimum. It is the sphere outside labor which defines freedom and fulfillment, and it is the definition of the human existence in terms of this sphere which constitutes the negation of the performance principle. This negation cancels the rationality of domination and consciously derealizes the world shaped by this rationality, redefining it by the rationality of gratification. While such a historical turn in the direction of progress is rendered possible only on the basis of the achievements of the performance principle and of its potentialities, it transforms the human existence in its entirety, including the work world and the struggle with nature. Progress beyond the performance principle is not promoted through improving or supplementing the present existence by more contemplation, more leisure, through advertising and practicing the higher values through elevating oneself and one's life. Such ideas belong to the cultural household of the performance principle itself. The lamentation about the degrading effect of total work, the exhortation to appreciate the good and beautiful things in this world and in the world hereafter is itself repressive insofar as it reconciles man with the work world, which it leaves untouched on the side and below. Moreover, it sustains repression by diverting the effort from the very sphere in which repression is rooted and perpetuated. Beyond the performance principle, its productivity as well as its cultural values become invalid. The struggle for existence then proceeds on new grounds and with new object objectives. It turns into the concerted struggle against any constraint on the free play of human faculties, against toil, disease, and death. Moreover, while the rule of the performance principle was accompanied by a corresponding control of the instinctual dynamic, the reorientation, the reorientation of the struggle for existence would involve a decisive change in this dynamic. Indeed, such a change would appear as the prerequisite for sustaining progress. We shall presently try to show that it would affect the very structure of the psyche, alter the balance between Eros and Thanatos, reactivate tabooed realms of gratification and pacify the conservative tendencies of the instincts. A new basic experience of being would change the human existence in its entirety.